Understand that the larger the organization, even the landscape architects out there know this, that some of the language can get complex, but what, what, what we did here within this manual was take the Caltrans language and actually simplify it. You may have to simplify it again, but the core information is in there to show the proper way to use the product. So that's the, that's the key aspect of it. And then hopefully, uh, time permitting, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the economics of use of compost because I am so tired of people telling me, well, we use compost, but it's too expensive. So there's, there's, there's a, I'm priming some people for that, okay? All the things I talked about earlier were, were research-based. We've done a lot of work with this. I mean, we're approaching 30 years for the composting industry in the U.S. now, believe it or not. We understand how to make good products. doesn't mean we, that composters always do, but we know how to make good products. Uh, and we understand the primary benefits and how to use it. You know, we're, the one thing that's interesting in the U.S. is we've invented a lot of uses for compost, and um, people from other countries actually watch what we're doing because of that. So, but, we, but basically, we know how to use this stuff, um, and we know how to produce it. Lots of, lots of uses for compost, in, generically in the landscape sector, but also you know, in food production. And you primarily use the product incorporated into the soil and incorporated into a mix, a component to a mix, or used on the soil surface, okay? So these are the types of things we'll talk about. And what I'm going to do is talk about the use of, the, of compost, uh, start off talking about the Caltrans uses that, that, that we have specs for, and then uh, at the end I'll go over some uh, other uses that aren't in their specs yet, but if you're, uh, you may want to talk about the use of them in your specific applications. Okay? Caltrans is now only purchasing uh, STA certified compost, and if you want information on the STA program, you go to the U.S. Composting Council's website and click on STA, but it stands for the Seal of Testing Assurance Program. I have a couple of these sheets uh, explaining uh, the program, but I would give these to composters if they're not in the program yet, if, you, if you're here. And the idea of the program basically is to test the product using uniform test methodologies um, for a specific number of parameters. And this label that you see here off to the right is a uniform label that everybody in the program, it gets generated by labs. So the key, one of the key reasons for this is when you have a large end user like a DOT or a specifier like a landscape architect, well, they may be specifying the use of compost in a project that's 100 miles in any direction from where they are. Well, that source of compost may not be the same source but they have a frame of reference from what they're buying, you need to have so, uh, a, an easy way to compare it. So we have a series of labs that all use the same test methodologies. The composters are supposed to pull samples in a, uh, a specific statistical way. And what we're trying to do is bring the level of uh, conformity up a level. Um, and reason being is people out there who are using and specifying the use of mulches and soils there are no specifications, and there's no regulation in those industries. And you probably know the products can change from one truckload to the next. But what we're trying to do is, is go past that here. We're trying to bring compost to a different level um, uh, of uniformity so people feel confident in what they're buying and specifying. So, um, so there's a series of things that we test for in all the products, everything from nutrients to stability and maturity, which are uh, test methods, uh, your... Um, that, that tests for basically uh, the fact the product is finished. It's ready to be used. We're not going to stick it in the ground and lose ni have nitrogen deprivation instead of supplying uh, nitrogen, okay, or cause, cause plant stunting. So this program we have, I think, oh, I think there's about 5 million cubic yards of compost in the program now, 150 composters across the U.S. Uh, the, the program has gotten quite popular in, uh, in California. Um, and one of the things we tell people is um, specify STA certified compost. Uh, if you're going to buy it, uh, specify it. If you want to understand more about that and how to do it, just ask me. and I'm happy to send you information on that. But one of the things that we had in the early days of the composting industry, it doesn't happen anymore, of course, is that we have composters who may send their compost samples to three different labs to get the numbers that 
meet the specification that they're trying to fill. Well, we, we don't need that. We've been around too long. We don't need that, that gamesmanship. We need to do things properly and make sure the end users get the right product so they don't have any failures in the field. So you'll notice on the bottom here, I talk about general landscape applications. The bottom says soil amendment parentheses compost. That is the Caltrans, Caltrans term uh, for the compost that would be specified in planting bed applications for the use in tree planting backfill mixes and turf establishment. So this is probably the most popular application across the world for, for compost, basically fixing garden beds. You know, where it used to be when I was first starting in the industry, you used peat and some other things, maybe aged manure, where now we use compost. And what we kind of found out with the ornamental applications and the desire to continue that carbon cycle we were talking about, you get a 20 to 30 percent uh, incorporation rate in the soil that's typically the range where you need to be, okay, for most crops. Right? Now, we're not talking agriculture. We're talking horticulture and turf, all right? 20 to 30 percent organic uh, uh, application rate. So that's approximately equivalent to a one to two inch soil uh, uh, application rate incorporated to six to eight inches deep, all right? The reason we're going six to eight inches deep is that most plants' minimum root depth depth is going to be six to eight inches deep. If you can go a foot deep, increase the application rate, and go a foot deep if you can do it. Be basically, the, 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 the better the root zone, the larger the root zone you can create for a lot of these plants. If we're talking about keeping them alive during times of stress, the better. But it costs money and people cheat on that all the time. Okay, But 20 to 30 percent incorporation rate, that's an important number. Apply it, incorporate it. Also, remember this: um, we are not um, putting up a a, um, uh, a space satellite here. We're planting trees and shrubs. If we're off a millimeter, it's okay. Like life's not going to end, right? Okay. So let's keep it all. Uh, I do work in the UK, and in, in in Europe, they they try to be very very precise about things. They, I think if they're forgetting, we're growing. I'm growing a stinking shrub here. All right. I'm not dealing with somebody's diabetes medicine. All right? All right? All right. So you incorporate uniformly incorporated, obviously. That's one of the goals. Remove large clods, stones, things like that. That, that, that kind of mess up the planting bed. That's the main, that's the main reason for that. And then you uh, apply as, as you're supposed to, as necessary. Um, Janet brought up a great point. She's a horticulturalist like I am. We have a tendency of planting too deep. Very bad for plants. So many things go wrong with, um, with disease when you plant a plant too deep. Okay? Do you everybody know what I mean? So if you have a plant, you can tell when you buy that plant what portion was above ground and what portion was below ground. Even in a herbaceous plant, a green plant, you can tell. And when you plant too deep, you end up sometimes waterlogging something that was above ground, and that's typically an area with fungal diseases attacked. So don't plant too deep. And we also found that as, as we've gotten much better at being bad at managing soil, we find that we need to plant higher because we can drown the plants in their own root ball in, in the soil. And we do that in North Carolina all the time. The soil is so dense that we can, uh, water can't escape the, the, uh, the hole we dig, and you actually drown the plant. So we part, put part of the root ball above ground. Now, I'll show you some pictures of that. But once you apply, you water in thoroughly. Uh, main reason for that is that's, that's your mode of compacting the soil around the plant roots. The biggest problem we have when there's mistakes made is um, people sometimes get concerned that they shouldn't compact the soil. Um, you shouldn't get psychotic about it, but you do have to do that. You have to have the soil uh, touching the roots. If you have air pockets, those roots will die. They'll dry out and they'll die, okay? So sometimes, depending on where you are, people will water in their plants thoroughly as a means of compacting the soil instead of doing it mechanically, all right? But jumping on the soil a little bit is okay. This is a case study that um, is going to be up on the website very, very soon. It's, 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 it's basically the Presidio. They compost. They put in uh, trees all over the place, and they're basically using it the same way you would do a garden bed, okay? One of the interesting things about the composting industry, and this happens all over the world, is as the composting industry has expanded, um, so has the manufactured soil industry. 
So we have a lot of composters now who make blended soils for the landscape industry, and it's kind of a neat place to be because if a landscaper wants to put in a berm, a raised berm like we have here, a planting bed, um, you can go to a composter and say, can you make me a one-third, one-third mix of sand, soil, and compost? And a lot of them can do it. They have the equipment. They have the access to the other bulk products. It happened, it's happened in Canada. It's happened throughout um, uh, Australia, uh, through, through Europe. And the simple fact about the reason why this blended soils industry grows is because we finally have a consistent, high-quality, but inexpensive organic matter source. Right? And they actually did this with peat up in Canada because peat is so cheap up there. Um, but it's a great, it's a great industry for, um, uh, for the landscapers. You can go out there and start specking things now. So here's my, uh, my old home in North Carolina. This is a, you can't tell, but that's soil right there. Um, you notice how I'm planting that, that, that root ball is, uh, is a couple inches above ground? You notice that? That's because those, those top roots are the ones that need oxygen the most. And... Um, we, can, we make bricks in North Carolina, all right, and clay pots. So I could very easily drown that plant. So uh, there's my wife who's a horticulturalist, and I have her doing the heavy work <laughs> because I'm not stupid, right? So uh, and she, she doesn't work out as much as I do, so she needs some physical exercise, so we, I let her do that. And, um, I, um, but you notice here, you notice uh, similar to what Janet was talking about, about this wide root uh, hole now. This is, this is the trend to ha not have plants get root bound. We go shallower and wider. And that is the, the best way to plant a tree nowadays if you're going to do a singular plant, which is starting to co go out of vogue. But and you'll even see people taking their spades and their shovels and, and, and using it like an axe and etching around that, that hole to make sure there's a place that the roots can actually blow through when they need to. But you know what you actually see happening in specifications of landscape architects out here? Uh, what we're seeing a trend, a, more, a, a better trend for is making, putting three and four trees and shrubs in an area and sweetening up and incorporating it like a giant planting bed and you never have to worry about the roots getting root bound. So you see that happening more than singular plants nowadays. I think it's probably a good practice. But making a proper root ball or, or, or a proper hole is half the battle. And getting the landscapers to follow through and make that perfect hole is the other battle. Um, my wife has her horticulture degree from Penn State. And I did a project up there. And it was, it was awesome. I took pictures just to ridicule my wife and her degree, you know, her, her, her college. Um, she reminds me, whenever I do that, she reminds me that that their, their freshman football team could beat my college's varsity team. And that's true. So I have to shut up a little bit when it comes to that. But um, I have these great pictures of they were planting these, these beautiful rhododendrons. And they were planting the, the company they hired. You could barely put the trees into the hole that they built. I mean, there's like a quarter of inch around going. They're just sliding it in there. And I'm like, what a half-ass job that is. <laughs> And not one of the professors caught them doing this. I mean, I can't, but our land grant university for agriculture. And I mean, I just, I, I had a laugh about it. But I ridicule her nonstop, which is fair game. We dig out that, that beautiful dirt that we have there, that soil. And typically you blend it at a two to one ratio, soil to compost. You never backfill with pure compost. Never. Never, never, never. Why, Ron? Oh, let me explain. Right? Um, basically, there are two things, and the same reason you never put compost in a pot and put a plant directly into it. Uh, it has too much nutrients, even though they're slow release, often has too much nutrients for certain plants, and water doesn't percolate through it. It's actually, uh, the, all the great things it does in the soil, it doesn't do stand, standing alone in a pot. It doesn't have all those same benefits. It holds too much water simply. We have had people who've actually tried to get crazy with compost. You know, a little's good, a lot is better. You know, we have a lot of people do things like that. And you literally drown plants in their own pot because the, the stuff holds water so well. Okay? So you don't do that. You're always blending. You're always blending. So typically it's two to one. If you have an extreme, extremely sandy soil, sometimes even one to one, especially if you know you can't water. Um, and you see we're blending here. By the way, notice that I am doing the blending here. That's the brain matter work. 
You know, getting that, getting that mix just, just perfect. When I say that, understand my wife had much better grades than I did through my whole life. You know, she's the one with the brains. So don't get me wrong. Um, but she doesn't know soil like I know soil. We have a different relationship, right? Um, so you, you were going to go and backfill around the, the plant, right? The root ball. See, see, she, she, she's not afraid to tap that in there. Make sure we have good. Uh, root ball to, to soil uh, contact. But notice here, I'm not going to leave the top of that root ball exposed and just put mulch over it. I take the other soil blend, that, that, that two to one blend, and put it over the top. That root ball, if I just put mulch over it, you see how it's exposed, that would dry out and die. Okay, that, you can't do that. So notice that the middle picture shows that the whole thing is covered by that blend. Right? And then we mulch over top of it. Now, what I just showed you there is the best way to plant a tree, and it probably happens one out of a hundred times in the real world because it's time-consuming. But that is the right way to plant a tree or a shrub. Okay? The same type of compost could be used in, uh, you could call it soil manufacturing or soil blending, but this is basically uh, fixing poor soil for turf establishment. And this is a roadside that has sandy soil. They knew they couldn't water it, so when they ripped up the, the ground to put these uh, communication cables in, they said, right, well, you can rip that up, but you have to revegetate. So we're putting down that, in this case, it was two inches of compost incorporated to six inches deep. And you see a nice uniform planting bed there for, for seeding. Dealing, we're doing the same thing here. We're dealing with the large, the large stones and, and clods and things, uh, making sure that they're out of the root zone, uh, or out of the soil surface, really. Um, and you can do this for, sa for seeding or for sodding. And in this case, they, um, they dry seeded and then they straw mulched and, and tacked it down. But really, the, some of that is overkill. Some of that's overkill. Nowadays, you know what people do? They use these, has anybody seen these pneumatic blower trucks that blow out? I'll show you some pictures of these things. You could go there and in, we infuse the seed right into that. You could just blow the seed on top of that or you could just hide your seed. Um, right on top of that, and I don't know if you can see how green the grass is. It's in the shade a little bit, but that, but that grass is so green, and it was all natural rainfall, you know, um, and a little bit of luck, and we had great take, and it you know, worked beautifully. We could do the same thing with heavy soils, and my old company did hundreds and hundreds of ball fields where, um, I'll preach to you now for a second. Do you know that every single year, Six to eight boys die on the on the football fields, high school football fields, every single year in the United States. Six to eight boys die from typically from spine or spine injuries or neck injuries, and we still have fields that are poorly maintained. And these kids are playing on fields that are rocks. When they get dry, they're literally rock, and it's just it's it's totally totally inappropriate. And uh, where where I where I was was working with soils. We had very, very dense soils. So we'd have people at the end of the year just put sod over the center of that field. So this is the American way, right? Cover up the problem, quick fix, it looks good, didn't solve the problem. You know what the problem is? The problem is the bulk density and the compaction of that soil. So what we started to do is we priced our compost so we could put down two inches in the center of that field, incorporate it in and reshape it, and then seed at the same supply cost as it would cost to get sod, okay? Just to get people to start doing the thing right so it was safer to play on. And Penn State University actually did this incredible research showing statistically, they did a two-year research study collecting data. The better maintained football fields are, the less, injury, less injuries and the less severe industry, uh, injuries that you get statistically. We've proven it safer fields and we still we have school districts that skimp on this that's the first place they start saving money and it's very very inappropriate there's a big fallacy about synthetic fields because I studied this years ago um, that it's cheaper to maintain and everything else it's not at all they actually kids have to get shots um, antibiotic shots and they have to spray the fields with uh, disinfectants because they leave part of their flesh on the fields it, it literally rips ab abrasions part of their, f I mean, it's disgusting, really, seriously. 
I'm, I'm going to leave you with that image, by the way. I'm not going to go over the specs in detail because it's very boring. These are the general specs we want for those three applications. Uh, it, you'll notice under particle size, it's, it's primarily a fine compost we want to put in the ground. We don't want to put excess large pieces of carbon in the ground. We don't want that, okay? Um, we want a clean product. All the products have to go through a proper heating. You test for metals and pathogens, so we're in good shape there. Mulching. Um, compost, coarser grades of compost can be used as effective mulches, weed, uh, weed block mulches, okay? If you use a fine grade of compost as a mulch, it's going to be a planting media for weeds, okay? That's what we use it for, right? We use it because it grows stuff good. So we have to use a coarse fraction, and I'll show you that in a second, but it works very, very effectively. Again, my wife doing the work, um, nothing wrong with that, guys, nothing wrong with that. Typically, two to three inch application rate, right? Now, let me just tell you what happens here. You know, when you have some fines in this product, it's okay, because what happens is all the coarse particles actually have a lower bulk density and they float. A little bit of wind, a little bit of settling. The fine stuff filters down, the coarse stuff rises. Happens all the time. You even see that composters out there on the tops of compost piles. The coarse stuff comes to the surface and you dig into it. The compost doesn't look like that. It looks like nice fine material. So that's very typical. Um, spread it evenly. Obviously some people will water it in and it does a nice job. Remember this, um, you keep all your mulches off of the stems and the trunks of trees. You know, it's a very good practice to do that. It reduces vectors getting to the tree trunks. That's not a compost comment. It's a every mulch comment that people do all the time. They put mulch up the side of the tree trunks. It's Terrible, terrible um, cultural practice. You never do that. You always keep it off the trunks or the stems of the trees, okay? I will tell you, though, some people will use fine compost, this very black fine compost, and will deal with the weeds because they like the color of it and because a lot of people buy mulch and it's an aesthetic decision and not a functional decision. They don't, they don't want the coarse bits. They don't mind pulling the weeds out because it looks prettier on the ground being dark, staying dark longer. So, but if you want a functional mulch as far as weed suppression, you have to have the coarse bits. Now, the one thing you'll notice under particle size here is we're actually specifying a product that has no more than 25% fines. We want coarse material here, okay, for a functional mulch. I will tell you right now, is it as pretty as bark mulch? Hell no, it's not. But bark mulch is getting more and more. I just did some work in Santa Barbara. Forty to sixty dollars per cubic mar yard for mulch? You got to be out of your mind. No way. I'm way too cheap for that. Way too. And my wife could attest to that, frankly. That's why she was laboring, by the way, instead of tying somebody in. Um, so, um, but anyway, we're looking for a coarse material in this application. Okay? People say, are there termites in this product? No. Termites, insect life cycles are so easy to disturb. It's so easy to knock out, so they're never going to last through the composting process. Literally impossible. Basically, if you sell the Caltrans, it, you have to be enrolled in the STA program, which means it's tested on an ongoing basis. So when we test for pathogens, if you're knocking out the pathogens, that's a, in the human pathogens, that's what we test for, because that's what the states want us to test for. You knock them down, you take care of the plant pathogens and the weeds. They're less tolerant than human pathogens are to the heat, heating process. So it's used, we don't test for every little thing. You can't do it. It's too expensive. Um, you, use it as a, you use the human pathogens as an indicator. Let me just say this, that the Integrated Waste Management Board, when you, get a, when you get a license to compost, you have to test every 5,000 yards going out the door, and you're testing for metals and pathogens. So their testing requirements are actually more rigorous than, than STA is uh, when it comes to pathogens and metals. So you don't have to worry about safe products getting out. Um, the one thing that, that the, 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 the STA program is that's different than what the states do is we test for horticultural parameters, not just health and safety. Okay? Once the products are, once end users know the products are safe, they don't even care anymore. They get it. But you've got to know that horticultural stuff to know what you're buying so you can use it properly. Do you know what I mean? I mean, once people get past the fact that it was, you know, and frankly, you know, green waste does not have many 
human pathogens in it, okay? It's not the same thing as biosolids, okay? Which we make great compost out of, frankly. Now, this is another application that is being used uh, by Caltrans, but also other DOTs have done this. There's a big movement to go after, uh, to use compost in arid areas with very, very high mineralization rates. And they typically, in these situations, um, are planting natives, okay? So anybody familiar with natives? They go into arid conditions. Um, they don't like a lot of nutrients, right? They don't compete well. When you put too many nutrients out there, the weeds outcompete the natives lots of times, right? So this is a clever thing that Caltrans did, but actually Washington, state of Washington and Oregon, on the east side of their states, which are literally deserts, okay? They are doing the same exact thing, and it's working. They're using coarse compost with a high percentage of large particles, carbon in there, okay? And by doing this, what they do is they trick the system. They put excess carbon into the soil. So that carbon has to break down, if not in the composting pile, in the soil. When the microbes break down that carbon, guess what they need? They take nitrogen from the soil. Um, so by doing this, what, what ends up happening here is we use green waste compost, coarse compost, and when we put this into the soil, uh, as the organic matter, the, the carbon is breaking down, it takes the nitrogen from the compost to break down the carbon. So all this extra carbon that invigorates the growing system isn't there for the natives. It doesn't make the natives crazy uh, and make them grow too fast, and it doesn't invigorate a lot of weed growth. Interesting, they did a trial up towards Lake Tahoe, and they got much denser vegetation, and they did some studies up there, and they were just thrilled up in these desert conditions up there, low moisture conditions, how well it works, and they started doing this back in 2004, and actually, that's one of the Caltrans areas that has gotten the most aggressive in using uh, the compost, using this funky coarse compost concept, and they, in their study, it, they showed all these benefits from uh, improving water holding capacity to improved infiltration rates, all the things we talked about earlier, and they came up with a whole bunch of potential uses for the product because of the study they did, this initial study they did, and they're specking it and using it, and it's working. And this compost here is also going to be a, um, a, a compost that has a, uh, it's going to be more like a mulch compost than a soil amendment compost. We're putting excess carbon into the ground. Here is the biggest growing area uh, biggest growing use for compost across the uh, the U.S., and it's the use of compost in erosion control. So how many people out there dealing with N -DP N uh, NPDES phase two, right? Well, compost is going to be the answer for a lot of this stuff. I will tell you what. Um, my, my old company back in the 90s, uh, 80s, that used to sell compost, a compost brokerage company in the East Coast, we also had a paper grinding facility that we made hydromulch. And if you would have told me in the late 80s that we would be Using compost and erosion control economically, I never would have believed it, but it is really uh, incredible. So let me just show you some things. I want to remind you before we talk about this that when we talk about using compost in blankets and even in berms, which are not in the Caltrans specs yet, we're talking about managing a sheet flow of water. Does any, everybody know what that is? No. So I will tell you what it is, right? It was rhetorical with that, that question, just so you know, because I was going to tell you anyway. Right? Um, it's kind of when I lecture my children. They turn me off, but I'm lecturing anyway, right? Right. Um, right, so that's, just imagine you're having a nice, one of your nice rainstorms, it's coming over a slope, and it's just pouring down the side of the slope. That's a sheet flow, okay? Now just imagine that that slope is sloped in towards a highway, and there's a concrete, little concrete area that all the water accumulates and the little river runs. You ever see that? That's a concentrated flow. You do not use compost in a berm or a blanket application in a concentrated flow. It will not work. You'll, just, you'll carry away the material. The concept of the blankets are to absorb as much water as possible. Um, and the socks and the berms, water actually moves through them. They act as a filter and water actually moves through them. Okay, And I'll show you what I mean by that. These are the typical applications of these silt fences, which um, 
are not as effective as, as we think they are. Okay, They're in store. You're supposed to put the tail of these things in the ground. You can see the top picture. It's not in the ground. You can see another one where so much um, uh, sediment accumulated just took it over, knocked it over in weight. We see that happening all the time. So here's the same site using a compost berm, which is a little pyramid, right? Typically one foot high, two foot wide. <clears throat> and, and here's a sediment fence right next to it. And you can notice that the silt fence, or the, the berm can hold a heck of a lot more sediment and not move than the silt fence. That silt fence is going to burst. Any time now, it's going to burst, right? The other thing we found out through research is these, these berms are 20 to 30 times more efficient at removing uh, f small particulate matter than are the sediment fences, proven through University of Connecticut research. The fine particulate matter is the most damaging to the environment. You know why that is? The finer materials are, um, the more reactive they are. So the smaller they are, the higher the cation exchange capacity, the more metals, the more pesticides they can hold. And the lighter they are, the farther they travel in a film of water. We've proven this time and time again. So the finest stuff that gets through this well-known VMP is the most damaging, and we don't have people get away from that technology. And you know why? Because it's, in, it's in, been in the specs forever, but because when you look at it, the soil sitting behind it, it looks like it's working. Right? But you, there are poor spaces in this stuff, and all the fine stuff blows right through it. Here's another example where we actually created a dam. The fine particulate matter on the silt fence got stuck there, and that's going to that's gonna buckle at any time. It'll buckle from the water pressure, right? 8 pounds, 8.2 pounds per gallon, right? Just a matter of time. So remember, we're trying to have the water go through. We are a filter. That's what we're using this for. Here's a great example where we use straw and, uh, uh, straw and hydro seed f uh, on a slope. Where we used the, and we used a compost blanket right next to it. We got seed germination, yeah, because we hold water. Here's where we use one of those rolled blankets. Very expensive um, application to do this. You staple it to the ground. We use two, one and two inch compost blankets, just blowing compost onto the ground, coarse compost, and we infuse the seed right into it, and you can see the difference. Here's a typical application going on a slope where they're going to blow it on, they're infusing the seed into it. But the thing I want you to notice is the dark color, actually, we can apply this later in the year, and because of the heat absorption, we can actually get germination later in the year because the dark color will absorb the, uh, the sun's heat. And we can actually get earlier germination and later germination. People that do use binders, their um, uh, they're gums, their natural gums, and a lot of people want to use it, but... Um, I find it's very marginal. I've just found you just typically do not need it. The way the blankets work, so just think about this. You have a bare slope. You have a soil particle. It's somewhat rounded. The rain hits it. This energy, it gets dissipated onto the soil particles, and they tumble and they roll. And you see, remember those rills you see down the roadsides? That all comes from energy, from the momentum of the, of the, um, the, the soil particles. And then you create rills. So when you cover the slope, we, these, these shredded products, they, they, they knit together very nicely and make a blanket. And what it also does is it's very porous. So in these heavy soils where the rainwater hits the soil surface and can't penetrate fast enough, it has to run. So there's much more momentum or, or water velocity. When it hits the compost, it absorbs very rapidly, and it doesn't want to run on the surface. It absorbs first. So you percolate the water better, and you slow its velocity. So, and on top of that, you're covering up these soil particles, and they can't gain, they can't tumble. And that's about all these weird things that occur. And we need this combination of coarse and fine particles to make this work. Blowing wood chips on a, on a slope does not work as a coarse grade compost. It does not. Coarse grade compost is stringy. It doesn't float, and it creates a mat. Chips actually run off of slopes. And the, the great benefits are you get this intimate contact with the soil, and that's the greatest benefit you get that stops the sediment movement, okay? Um, the other thing that happens is uh, you, you reduce your discharge off of the slope. Um, Two-inch application will hold a half to one inch of water. You get less water leaving the slope, right? 
So here's your application. It's one to two inches based on your slope length and what else, on several applications. You apply it, you go over the top of the slope by a few feet. So water coming off the flat area can gain momentum onto the slope. This is a slope actually, it was a 30 year old roadside um, in Texas that they can never, they never got proper vegetation in 30 years until they, apply, they used uh, compost. And this is one of the trial areas that convinced TxDOT that they needed to use compost. And they've had just incredible success over the years. Typically, two to one slopes are the max that we use it, but we break that rule all the time. Uh, trust me, we do. Uh, coarse compost we're using. This is in uh, Lompoc, near Santa Barbara, and I just went and saw this slope. This was a kind of a strange one. This, is, this was done before the Caltrans spec was developed. One-to-one -one slope, four-inch application rate. They had, to they had to strap people down to spray this. Um, pretty, pretty wild, really. And um, the other thing they did is they actually put a netting over the top of this. And they put a very, th I'll show you a picture of it because I just saw this slope two, weeks ago, uh, two days ago. Um, and they actually have very, very fine, if you want to use this on a one-to-one -one slope and you're really paranoid, there's a great, very, very fine degradable material that you could put on there and hold the slope. It's still going to be cheaper than using a blanket, and it's going to be more effective than a blanket. But um, um, here's part of the slope going up the slope. You can see vegetation, vegetation starting to come in. It's very, very interesting, though. This, these were natives that were planted. And wherever there was more water, they, were, they were, had some irrigation issues on this slope. And um, wherever there was more water, they had better, uh, a better take, just like you would imagine, right? One-to-one -one slope in Texas, no binder, no netting, no nothing. Washington State DOT, they used the product. They did trials. Take a look at this bottom picture. They terraced the area. There's really no soil on that side. They're using compost as fake soil. Look to the left-hand side of the picture. You notice that there's no vegetation there? They ran out of compost by accident. And wherever they had compost, they had vegetation. Wherever they, wherever they ran out, they didn't get anything to grow. And this was one of the first things they did, and they said, boy, this stuff actually does work. And they're, they're, they're the biggest buyer in the state of, of, of uh, Washington, their DOT today. We're using a coarser grade of product, but also notice the particle size. We've done studies on this where we are specifying specific particle grade compost here. The socks can be actually used in concentrated flows because we can actually attach them to the soil by pegging them down. So it's three-dimensional. It's a three-dimensional filter, and we use a coarse material because we have to have water go through it, and we have this compaction factor. Okay. Once it gets wet, they're very, very heavy, and they don't move, and they will, they will just take the contour of the soil because of their, they're just because of their weight. You don't have to dig them into the ground or anything. That's one of the socks. You can get ones that are, you know, all black. You can get one different, diff different ones, and, but basically they're, they're self-contained berms is what they are. Uh, they do really well with concentrated flows. And the cool part about them, too, is when you're done with them, if you want to use them not for per permanent sediment control, but, but um, temporary, you just slip them. And then you just walk down the, the area, w pulling the sock and removing the sock and leaving the organic material there. Uh, some of the socks, they are biodegradable. Uh, even these that are technically not biodegradable, they are um, a photodegradable in a year or so. But uh, let me tell you what happens. Most people use these socks and they say they're for temporary erosion control. And they end up, when they're blowing them, blow seed into them. And they use them for permanent control. And they do an incredible job. And they go long term. But guess what? You have grass coming out of there like a chia pet. Guess what? You're not photodegrading because you're blocking all the sun's rays. They drill right through them. And they use them as live stakes, they call them. Call them. And, they'll, and they'll use, they'll use natives, native trees yeah, for wetlands, for slopes. Really a cool application. It's like a sausage, a sausage roll, and you just you walk down down the area or the uh, the perimeter of the area that you want to apply it. You don't pick them up and move them; they're too heavy. You apply the, apply it as you go, following whatever contour you want. You can use it where there are uh, there are concentrated flows. You can peg them into the ground, and you can sleeve them. So you can go ten miles long if you want to, and sleeve them in top of each, on top of each other into each other. 
so there's no break. Your specification here, you're going to notice it's a very coarse grind of product. We have to move water through that material. There are even chemical admixtures we can add into the compost for this application. So if you know the water coming off this slope is high in phosphates or high in a heavy metal, we actually have admixtures we can add into the material and bind it up and reduce that into the water that's blowing through it. So this is really bioengineering stuff, but this is a new technology. It's 10 years old. Using compost filter berms. So this is, you know, uh, the, the sock is a patented process. This is not patented. You're using compost as a coffee filter. You know, this is a three-dimensional filter. Remember this, the power of the pyramid. There's a, 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 there's a uh, engineering stability, one high to two wide. If you go two foot high, you go four foot wide, right? Foot and a half tall, three foot wide. Um, and there's an incredible stability to this. But again, you're using the coarse material. Here's a good example in, on a Texas roadside. Um, you'll notice here that we vegetated, so we want that there long term. Now notice, here's your sediment being built up, built up behind it, but there's water percolating through. That's exactly what we want to see. We want the water to go through, not over, right? To use it as a filter. Here's a combination of blankets and berms. I love this because typically they put this nasty three-quarter inch rock along this roadside. You drive off the roadside, it, it kicks up onto the highway, the road, you pop tires. And this is just a lot nicer looking to me. And you can vegetate the area, blanket and berm combination. This is what we're going to see some more of, stormwater. There's, I'm glad we're, there's people here talking about managing water. You know, more rooftop gardens, right, both extensive and intensive uh, rooftop gardens compost is very often used in the, um, uh, as the organic matter in the mix. Rain gardens, where compost is typically blended with sand um, to help hold, uh, basically hold the nutrients in, on site to have the vegetation. But you know what else? They've also done research, and we're, and we're binding the, um, the, 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 um, the pollutants that are running into this, storm guard, uh, this, um, this rain garden uh, onto the organic matter. We're using it not only to grow plants, we're using it for a, uh, a filtration media, okay? And we can do this through cation exchange. Uh, living walls, we are actually building out of those socks structural walls. And again, they will attach themselves, the roots will grow through them. You peg them in initially, and then they will literally grow onto the slope, and they're incredibly effective at staying where they are. Top dressing was talked about earlier. Uh, my company was do doing this years ago on the East Coast back in the mid-80s where we were going onto ball fields and where we couldn't rip up the ground and totally redo the fields. We core aerified to pull plugs out of the ground, top dress, drag uh, the, the compost back into those holes. We seed it and um, we've had these incredible, incredible successes with this. Here's a home lawn. This is, a, this is actually a, a combination soccer and football field. Um, again, we couldn't rip up. They didn't want us to rip up the whole field, so we're, we're putting the organic matter down through, these, through core aeration, and we're slowly modifying that compactable zone. Three-eighths inch screen, and here, where you get a lot less rain, you probably use quarter-inch screen product. But it also has to do with the, um, the turf variety you use. So uh, where I come from, we have cool season grasses and they grow upright and you guys use warm season grasses primarily right a lot of them grow laterally so their canopy is very dense so finer the compost the more aggressive dragging afterwards is needed to get that organic matter into the ground the organic matter does not do as much good on the ground you got to get it in the ground remember this that carbon is literally food for the microbes we always talk about all the benefits of the microbes all they see as a food source for the microbes. Get it in the ground, right? Get it in the ground. That's where they are. We build very expensive ball fields and golf courses with this. And we're actually building USGA approved golf course greens. This is a golf course my company built back over 20 years ago and visited maybe f three, four years ago. Total success, sand and compost instead of sand and peat. Look at the difference with compost and without compost. I don't know if you can see where we have the, the hole. There is such density in that rooting, it's incredible. And it's interesting, the, the USGA used to uh, basically tell people, you can't use compost. They wanted peat moss. And today, 
they've changed their tune. Compost holds more nutrients, higher cation exchange, cation exchange than peat moss, so it holds more nutrients and also has disease suppression. They're getting, they're getting criticized about all the pesticides they're using. So they're getting free disease suppression when they put it in the mix. All right? Topsoil manufacturing. Instead of bringing new topsoil onto a project landscape architects out there, fix the soil that's on the site. You can do this in situ or you could do ex situ. So here's a situation where we were going to bring in a lot of soil and instead we brought in three inches of compost and incorporated to about 10 inches deep. And I just want to show you something here. Look at the right side down there where we seeded. Nothing would grow. We didn't even, we couldn't even get weeds growing on this crap. Okay? But look at this. Look how dense and beautiful that is. You can, you can bl take poor soil, blend it, exit you, and then sell it off that way. Here's a great example here where we've blended soil. Uh, I won't give you the gory details, but this is actually at a cemetery site where they were paying to get rid of... Yeah, they're dying to use compost there too. Oh, that's so cheap and just... That's unworthy is what that is, right? But these guys were, were paying to tr truck the, the bad soil off-site buying topsoil in, and I made a personal bet with the person there at the cemetery. I said, give me the soil that you're paying to get rid of. I'll blend it with compost, and I bet you I make you a better soil. We'll test it than what you're buying. And he bet me, and I won the bet. And this was actually in the UK where they have uh, actual grades. They have a grading system for soil. And the compost soil, we, the soil we made was a full grade level above what they were buying, buying in. So they were buying worse stuff in and paying to get rid of the bad stuff. They were paying twice, and we just totally changed what they did. They keep all of it now, they buy the compost, they blend it, and they put it down. Saves them huge money, huge money. Um, and you can see the difference in color of the soil. Reclamation sites, we already talked about things like this. This is soil that was so high in zinc and also cadmium, but z so high in zinc that they couldn't vegetate anything until they put compost on it. And the compost actually bound the zinc as well as the cadmium so it didn't get translocated into the plants and they were able to vegetate it on a mine site. And I want to show you this because this is kind of a cool project I'm working on. Um, it's in between um, Glasgow and Edinburgh in Scotland where this is an old steel site and they had colliery waste, this, this rocky material that's generated through the creation of steel. And they were, they were built, they're building a championship golf course. They were going to have to bring in something like 300,000 tons of soil to build this golf course. And we did some experimentation. We took that stuff, we ground it down, and we intuitively said, well, we're going to turn it into sand. Okay, think about this now. We're going to have this fine particle, we're going to have some coarse particles, and we're going to use compost as the fine particles in this mix. And the USGA actually designed this golf course, uh, or the PGA, and they said, well, we're not going to tell you you can't do it, but it's not going to work, and we really don't support it. Well, there's the trial we did. It looked like it worked, didn't it? And there's the first fairway that went in. That's two and a half months old, that fairway. It's in Scotland. It will, you watch. This is going to be, well, we joke about it. They're already chasing the Ryder Cup for this, for this golf course. It's not even done being built. I walked on this fairway um, following the wettest winter they had in about 100 years. And there's no standing water a anywhere. We created a, a site that will hold water with the compost, but all the excess water just percolates out. All right? And look at the roots. I mean, you see the roots that we dug up here. It's incredible. Remember when we used to worry about lead-based paints, kids eating lead-based paint, and what it does to their brains? We're having that same type of syndrome happen in downtown, in inner cities, from lead gas, lead gas that we outlawed 20 years ago. Lead does not move. Kids eat soil, and some of these inner ki uh, city kids are getting the same brain disorder uh, from this. We've done research. We can bind it up with the compost, okay, vegetate over it, and we've done studies. Um, with rats, to show you eat that same soil with compost in it, and 50%, 60% less lead gets absorbed by the bloodstream of the animal. So binding it and not letting it get to the, get to the plant, the same thing ha can happen to humans. I mean, this is, it's pretty, pretty cool. And this is more information than you ever want to know. But if you're on Jeopardy one day, <laughs> and a question comes up, and Alec asks you some question, you just send me a check because I will have given you this incredible, this 
you know, you'll think about this when you're half drunk on wine this weekend. Cost savings with compost. You can use compost and save money, okay? I can't get into detail here. This is a big project that I worked on over in the UK again. Why in the UK? Because they're spending money to research this stuff and we're not anymore. Big job site. They were going to truck in an immense amount of soil. They were going to have to truck out soil to do this project. Instead of doing it, we brought compost in and incorporated it. Okay? Uh, we can't go over this in detail, but the cost of doing the project was estimated 1350 pounds per ton for soil to do the project the way it was originally spec'd. We went to the landscape architects, we did some blending trials, we did some testing. The actual cost was six pounds, 12 pence per ton, doing it our way. And we made a higher quality soil and lower, less carbon footprinting. We didn't truck the materials off. Everything worked out positively. Using compost as a top dressing. Um, not talking about putting it on a green or a tea, okay? But what we're talking about here is on a, on a ball field or a fairway, and you can use compost instead of a sand-based top dress, factor in the nutrient value and potential fungicide effect, and it's one-third the cost of doing this. Okay? The problem we have is a lack of creativity. People say it's more expensive. It's more expensive than doing nothing. Right? If people, I have landscapers say... I don't believe in planting uh, in fixing the soil because it's better for the plant if you don't. Bull. There's more research out there showing that if you fix the soil, it's better. There is old research that shows otherwise. Um, it's just not the truth. I just want to give you one quick example. Two quick examples and I'll be done. All right? Landscaping. Um, instead of putting peat or some type of soil amendment, and lime, if you use lime, and fertilizer, you put two inches of compost. The nutrients are there. You get a slight liming effect. That's all you do, okay? How do you kill plants? You fertilize them properly when you first plant the tree, okay? You don't fertilize anymore. You can't torch the plant with compost, all right? That will save you money. So two inches of compost, incorporate it in, you're done. You plant, okay? Main Department of Transportation, they invented this whole idea of erosion control. Um, it works so well for them, but the costs were problematic because they have such massive snow melts that the amount of water that comes off the slopes in the spring, they had to put down three and four inches of this stuff. You know what they did? They changed their specs. They used to have this spec that said after you, you develop a slope, you, do, um, you add soil and you finely grade it. And by the way, just so you know, everybody, when you finally grade these slopes, you make it more prone to erosion than when you leave, when you leave it a little bit undulating. So that's strike one. But all that money, and they have it, they call it a, a, soiling, a soiling and a, a, um, and seeding spec. So you know what they did? They said, my God, this, this other method works so much better. They basically said, you don't have to do any more fine grading. Once you do coarse grading, just blow the compost on with the seed. When you blow the compost, you make a nice grade. And you don't have to put any more energy into the slope. They change your spec. It's cheaper and it's more effective. Right? Okay? So we just have to be clever about some of these things. They work, but you're just not going to just add something into the system and do it cheaper. That doesn't work. We've got to be smarter than that about it. Okay? And I'm happy to help anybody who, who has interest in doing that and review specifications, whatever. All right? So there you go.